The legend lives on from the Chippewa on down of the big lake they call Gitchagumi. The Edmund Fitzgerald was a 729-foot-long ore carrier that sunk on November 10, 1975, in Lake Superior. It is famously known for being the largest ship to sink on the Great Lakes and the most mysterious story of them all. Now, let's look at the story at a more in-depth look. The Edmund Fitzgerald was christened on June 7, 1958, in River Rouge, Michigan. The ship would later have its maiden voyage on September 24, that same year. The ship was the largest on the lakes at the time of its maiden voyage and would keep the Queen of the Lakes title until 1971, when the ship Stuart J. Court became the Queen of the Lakes. Anyways, the Edmund Fitzgerald was a widely known ship around the Great Lakes going on routes from Duluth, Minnesota and Superior, Wisconsin, down to the lower lake areas like Detroit and Cleveland. She was owned by the Northwestern Mutual Insurance Company and was a part of the Columbia Transportation Fleet. So now that you know about the ship itself, let's fast forward to her last voyage on November 9th, 1975. The Edmund Fitzgerald was still in its prime in 1975. It was still such an icon and celebrity of the Great Lakes. November 9th, 1975. The Edmund Fitzgerald was taking on a load of 26,000 tons of iron ore pallets departing from Superior, Wisconsin, downbound for Detroit. Under her command at the time was experienced Great Lakes ship captain Ernest M. McSorley, having almost 40 years on the Great Lakes. He would always make sure that he was on schedule and he was considered a good businessman. After about six hours of loading and unloading the Fitzgerald, she was ready to depart Superior, Wisconsin for Detroit. About the same time the Edmund Fitzgerald was departing, the 647-foot-long Arthur M. Anderson, under the command of Bernie Cooper, was departing two harbors, Minnesota, downbound for Gary, Indiana. At this time, a warm and cold front was going to collide in Lake Superior, and the ships were receiving warnings for their fronts. These two fronts could most likely form a gale, so both captains at this point were preparing and waiting for what could be the worst. But little did they know, after this storm, only one ship would be afloat in the end. The Anderson was slightly slower than the Fitzgerald. As both ships made it to the top of Upper Peninsula of Michigan, they decided to change their course to see if they could make it out of the November gales. Later that night when his lights went out of sight, came the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. It was now November 10th, and Ernest McSorley of the Fitzgerald radioed the Anderson to tell him how he was handling. Ernest said that he had a couple of railings detached, and some vents were being thrown off of the Fitzgerald, but overall it seemed like the Fitz was in good condition to make it to the safety of Whitefish Bay. The Sulocks at this point, due to the horrible conditions of the storm, were closed down temporarily for the night and were not safe. At this point, the Anderson and the Fitzgerald were close to the Caribou Island. The Caribou Island, though, is very dangerous for a ship as they have sharp, shallow rocks that could tear a ship's hull right open. It is now around 7 o'clock p.m. and both ships are still fighting strong, but the Fitzgerald had a problem. It was taking on water. Ernest McSorley radioed the Anderson to tell them that the ship had a starboard list and that the ship was taking on water. But on the good hand, the bilge pumps were working, so that was helping them. Eventually, the Fitz radar was not working, so now the Fitz was sailing blind to through one of the worst storms in Great Lakes history. It is now 7.20 or around there, and the Anderson radioed the Fitz to say, How are you dealing out with your problems? And Ernest McSorley would say, We are holding our own. These are the last words anyone would hear from the Fitzgerald crew. The Anderson lost sighting of the Fitz. Bernie Cooper thought they just ran out of power. So Bernie Cooper eventually tried to radio the Fitzgerald. No response. He radioed them again. No response. Bernie knew that they couldn't have just went down. He radioed the Coast Guard telling them the incident. Bernie was hoping that the Fitz didn't take a nosedive. The Coast Guard launched a search for the missing Fitzgerald. Due to the big storms, the Coast Guard were not able to launch a helicopter or Coast Guard boat. A ship that was anchored in Whitefish Bay, the William Clay Ford, was contacted by the Coast Guard asking them to go back into the storm. 
The Anderson, which had made it out, was also asked to go back into the storm to go look for any survivors of the ill-fated Fitzgerald. Ultimately, in the end, they would only end up finding a torn apart lifeboat of the Fitzgerald. Does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn the minutes to hours? The searchers all say they'd have made Whitefish Bay if they put 15 more miles behind her. The Coast Guard eventually launched a multi-million dollar search with objects like submersibles to try and find the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. It is now November 14th, 75, and a U.S. military jet is carrying advanced metal detectors and detected the ship's stern flipped upside down and the bow right upside up. This was indeed the Edmund Fitzgerald. In the Detroit Maritime Cathedral, they rang the bell 29 times for each man on the Edmund Fitzgerald, and eventually in 1995, they launched one final expedition to the Fitzgerald's wreck to recover the bell and replace it with the one that had all 29 crew members' names on it. So now that you know about the story of the Edmund Fitzgerald, that is all for this documentary, and thank you for tuning in. Bye.